Hebrews chapter 12, verse one and two, simply says this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we, before we jump into this scripture and, and into this word. Let's, go, let's pray right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for all you've done in this place already through the great worship. God, I pray that you'll anoint our, our hearts to receive all that you have for us here today. God, anoint our minds to comprehend every point, Lord, that you want us to take in for ourselves, God. I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said amen. 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 You may be seated. I'm going to preach to you for a few moments from the title, Run Your Race. Run Your Race. In the world of marathon runners and long distance racing, there is a strategy often used called pace setters. A pace setter is a runner that is hired or designated by the team running to set a certain pace in the race for other runners to follow. The goal of the pace setter is very, very specific. You see, the pace setter isn't there to race for the front or, or, or sleep in the back of the pack and conserve energy for a future sprint. No, the pace setter is meant to run at a very specific speed that ensures a fast finishing time for the participants who choose to follow that pace. If they follow the pace of the pace setter, they will make this specific speed at the end. And in turn, the competitor, when they're following a pace setter, they don't have to try to, to lead, and, and, and lead the race and try to time what they're doing. Instead, the competitor can just follow this pace setter and sit back and allow the timing burden to be placed on someone else versus them having to deal with timing how they're running. And, and by doing this, they're able to prepare for the final push to the finish, and, and ultimately, they're able to finish their own race with the best possible time. In certain types of races, uh, they actually, because they believe in the concept of pace setters so strongly, it, they actually allow certain, they, they allow a set of pace setters to run the first half of the race, and then they'll, they'll actually veer off in a certain area of the race, and a new set of pace setters join the race to keep the time very specific so that, so that they all have the ability and stamina to set the most optimum pace for the run, the ones that are running the actual race. Yeah. Now... If you look into the world of racing, there is, there is a good bit of controversy in the running world on if pace setters are, are good for the sport. The ones against the pace setter say that it, it makes the race boring if you don't have one. Uh, often the marathon has an excitingly, uh, decidedly unexciting end to it simply because those who cannot hold the fast pace end up falling behind. And, and by the end of the race, often there's only one person left in the race to finish. So, so if you have pace setters that are, that are kind of measuring out everybody's skill set, then at the end of the race, there's only one guy crossing the finish line, and they're like, that's boring. We don't, we don't want to watch that race. It's boring for the casual spectator because there's no, there's no tight race in the end for people to cheer on. There's no drama and buzz and energy going on in the race. And since drama and buzz and energy attracts the biggest crowds, some argue that a pace setter actually messes up the fun for those of us who are trying to watch the race. The ones who argue for using a pace setter say that using pace setters make for the fastest finish time for each individual racer. In other words, it may not be as fun for the casual observer watching the race from afar, but it is awesome for the one actually running the race. You see, without a pace setter, here's what happens. What tends to happen in a long race is that the runners will group up and they'll, they'll slow down and they'll actually run at, the, at kind of the lowest common denominator and they sit back in the race. They don't push themselves mile after mile and try to stay at the edge of their, of, of, of their, of their timing and how, and how well they can run this race. They prefer to conserve energy like the ones around them are doing so that, so that they have the energy at the end to push and sprint and win. 
And yes, this strategy does make for dramatic finishes. And, and, and maybe there will be 10 or 15 or 20 marathon runners at the end of the race running towards the finish line. It may be fun and exciting for the audience and even, even sometimes feel good for the winner. But in reality, the winner may simply be the better sprinter of the pack, not necessarily the better marathon runner. The winner or, or, or even someone else in the race likely could have finished that marathon with a much better final time if they wouldn't have saved so much energy in the first half of the race, saving it just for the finish line. Most experts believe that without some type of pace setting, no runner would ever even approach breaking world records that have already been set in the past unless there's a pace setter involved. This term, pace setter, has moved beyond the racing world, which we, we hear it in all the time, and it's even entered into the language of business. It is used to describe companies who are constantly maintaining momentum. It is used to describe leaders who are very result-oriented. They're pace setters in their industry. In many business publications, pace setting means leading the way. You're intuitive. You're leading the market. You're, you're a trendsetter. The problem with using this term in the business world is the business world often forgets that the pace setter, from racing terms, pace setter, isn't actually supposed to win the race. I have read the articles and, and the scholarly thoughts surrounding what a pace setter in the business world means, and I understand what they're trying to use that as an example to say. I understand that. But they never mention the fact that the primary pur purpose of a pace setter in racing is just to help the ones around them get ahead and win. And so I don't like, in the, in the business world, I don't like to actually use the word pace setter all too often unless, I'm, unless I, I quantify and qualify what I'm referring to. But one term I do like and I study a lot and use is a term called the second mover advantage. You see, the second mover advantage is actually what someone following a pace setter gets to do. It, the, the second mover advantage refers to companies that don't normally lead the newest cutting edge innovation, but instead learns from the pace setters near them doing that innovation. And instead of, instead of trying to copy exactly what they do, they watch them and they wait and then they improve on what they're doing and they enjoy a second mover's advantage. This strategy often means they're not in front of the pack in what they're doing. But their strategy virtually assures <clears throat> that the second mover normally always wins the race. Let me give you some examples. Rarely is Apple first to introduce a product or feature. In fact, it's kind of funny because when they announce their new features in every iOS version, you always have those Samsung users who are saying, we've had that for five years. And they're right. Because Apple rarely leads the way in new features. But what they do is they learn from the pace setter near them and they come out with a better way of doing the same feature. They enjoy the second mover advantage. And because of that, rarely does Apple ever have a failure or product feature failure. They, it just gets incorporated into its, its ecosystem and everybody says, wow, it's the greatest thing that ever happened. Because of that overall strategy, listen to this. Apple is the largest company in the world ranked by market capital. Apple is valued at $3.441 trillion as of September 2024. And no, I didn't miss it. Did you mean to say billion? No, they have over a billion dollars of cash on hand, buddy. I'm talking they're valued at $3.441 trillion as of September 2024 because they employ the second mover advantage. Facebook and Instagram were not the first social media sites by far. The first mover of that technology was something called Six Degrees. I've never even heard of that. I had to Google what was the first social media company, the, the trendsetter of social media, Six Degrees. And then another one came out called Friendster. And another one, later, MySpace. Some of us got more familiar with MySpace. Oh, yeah, we remember MySpace till it died and went away. But Facebook and Instagram enjoyed the second mover advantage. They learned from others to win the market. Now... I'm sure right now you're, we're getting to that place in the message where you're wondering, so exactly, excuse me, Pastor, exactly what principle are you trying to show us today? We're, we, we've got it, okay. Is this maybe a lesson on racing history? Is this a business seminar? What are, what are we trying to learn? And what I'm trying to do is use some examples in the real world to show you that winning the race is often a different strategy than leading the pack. 
See, often we think about racing and we're like, the, the guy that's going to win is going to be the guy out front of everything. He's leading the pack. And what you'll find if you watch a lot of racing, what you'll find if you look at a lot of business principles, often the one leading the pack isn't the one who wins the race. Even, even when the strategy seems counterintuitive, so, sometimes the right call in a race is that you have to let runners pass you up. But the right call is as long as you keep pace with the pace setter. Sometimes the right call in business is to not be the first to market as long as you keep pace with the pace setter. And in like manner at, at all times, I would say, the right call in your spiritual walk and in your ministry and as you, as you, as you, as you follow after God, the right call is to follow instead of lead. Listen to what the Word of God says. You're like, oh, but I'm called to be a leader. No, 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 no. Listen to what the Word of God says in Hebrews 12 and 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. And I need you to catch this next part. How do we run with endurance the race God has set before us? Verse 2 says, we do this. By keeping our eyes on Jesus. Let me tell you, if you're leading the pack, you can't keep your eyes on Jesus. There's something about letting him get out in front. He is our pace setter. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. What I'm trying to show you is Jesus sets the pace. And if we will keep our eyes on our pace setter, he will, he will slow things down if we're perhaps going faster than we were prepared to go. And he will speed things up if we're perhaps being a little slower than we're capable of doing. He has designed our race from the beginning. It's a personalized race. And he wants you to win your race. Point at yourself, my race. The Bible says in Psalms 139, 13, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Listen to me carefully today. He didn't just create you and I in a mass factory run, just cookie cutter. This is the standard. I just pop, pop all this out. This is how it all looks. He took time on you and he took time on me. He knit us together in our mother's womb. We are handmade, not mass made. He has a plan for you. You are unique to him. I'm trying to remind you that we were created by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords all for his glorious purpose. And I know that because Jeremiah 29 and 11, one of my favorite verses in the whole world says, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. God has a purpose for each of us, a plan for each of us. Psalms 37 and 23 says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in his way. The race set before you was designed and orchestrated by our Lord and our Savior. And he is the pace setter to make sure you win that race. Now our strategy, our strategy should be very simple when it comes to this race, this marathon of life that we're all in right now. Our strategy should be simply this. Keep our eyes on Jesus. He is the way. He is the answer. He is the only thing that matters. Our strategy is keep our eyes on Jesus. John 13 and 15 says it this way. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. Jesus sets the pace. And if we will follow his example, I'm telling each and every one of you, we will win our race. Now, in researching about pace setters, I learned that in some major marathons like Berlin and Chicago and London, there are multiple pace setters in the race to set the pace for all levels of runners. You see, the organizers of those big races uh, want as many people to run the marathon as possible. So they design the marathon to be achievable for all levels of runners. They know that based on the skill level and the age of the runner, some runners may take five or, or six hours or even seven hours to run a marathon. Or, or if I'm in the race, 48 hours or so with a car in, in a hotel room on the way and breakfast and lunch and dinner. They also know that in the same race, in the same race that I need 48 hours to make, they might be advanced runners 
or even elite, elite Olympic level runners who can run the marathon in less than three hours. So they don't limit the race based on what season of life the runner is in. Instead, they just have multiple pace setters. In fact, all along the race, you can find pace setters running with a flag. They actually have a flag that tells the competitors around them what pace that pace setter is running the marathon at. Perhaps for one runner, they need to pace at the four-hour marathon. They see the flag that says four hours, and you pace with that pace setter. You don't get distracted by the other pace setters. You don't get distracted by the ones that might be passing you up or might be getting behind you. You just stay with your pace setter. For another one, they have a pace setter that might say two hours and 30 minutes. And, and, and that person can't get distracted by looking at the ones they're passing and saying, I don't have to work so hard. Look at all these ones I'm passing that are going three hours and four hours. Look at this. No, 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 no. They have to just stay with their pace setter. You see, not every runner is the same and not every pace can be the same. If, if a runner who, only need, who, who is only prepared in life for a four-hour marathon decided to try to keep pace with the three-hour marathon pace setter, that runner would very likely not finish the race at all. They would fall out. They'd have to give up. And if a runner who could do a marathon in two and a half hours decided to pace with the four-hour mar marathon pace setter, that runner would probably finish the race, but they would not come close to maximizing their potential. Right. And in like manner, and here it is, church, each of us, each of us have our own race. My race is mine to run. It's not yours to run. And your race is yours to run. It's not mine to run. The worst thing I could ever do in the race God has set before me is to try to pace myself with the wrong thing. If I allow the race, if I allow the race others around me are running to influence my journey in any way, if I allow the ones that are going right past me or the ones that I'm passing up to influence my plan for my race more than the plan Jesus has laid out for me, I am setting myself up for failure. I am. I'll never forget a few years ago, I don't know, Brenton was maybe 10 or 11 years old. We, were, we had a 4K race that was starting here at the church for, and our youth had sponsored and put it on. And I remember watching as, as they blew the horn to start the race and, and, and off Brenton and his buddies, they were a bunch, bunch of young, young kids, they all just took off running as fast as they could, sprint with everything they had, trying to maintain, the, just, just whoever was in front, they had to beat the guy in front. And about a quarter of the way through the 5K, they're all on the, on the ground, just laid out, just huffing and puffing, they're just done. People are walking past them at this point. Okay, it, it, the problem wasn't that, that they had the wrong attitude, that they, that they weren't gung-ho, that they were just lazy about it. No, no, they tried to run a race at the wrong pace. It can be so tempting in life to try to keep up with those around us. Not realizing that if we don't know the whole story about the person next to us, you may have started the race today next to an Olympic level marathon runner. Don't beat yourself up just because you can't keep pace with them. This isn't your season. That isn't your race. But I can tell you this. If you will run your race to the best of your ability, if you, can, if you will keep pace with the, the, the pace setter in your life, which is Jesus Christ, if you can be trusted to be faithful in what God has called you to do today, then I can guarantee you God will bring you to another level in the future. Your consistency in your pace today will allow you to run a new pace tomorrow. Let me remind you of a principle in the Bible that says this in Luke 16 and 10. If you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you're dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. God is constantly watching all of us to see, can I trust him? Can I trust Jared in the pace I have set for him? Or is he going to just flake out? I know it may not be a big pace at the time, but, but will he run the race I've set before him in the pace I have set before him? Because if he does, then I can trust him tomorrow to run a little faster pace. And I'll be able to trust him the next day to run and leave in a little faster pace until one day the season I'm in is going to be Olympic class runner. But it matters that I run my race the way God has designed it. The secret to it all is run your race. Unfortunately, as I've already hinted at, the greatest obstacle, the
the greatest obstacle to moving to a new pace in a new race is the desire to match the pace of those around us. The desire to run someone else's race. When we are constantly comparing the race God has set before us to the race others are running, when we play the comparison game with our neighbors and with our friends and even with our family, we will always be tempted to run at the wrong pace, not realizing the error of our ways. Pastor Jonathan has been preaching about distractions this past Sunday and this past Wednesday. And, and I, want, I want to tie into that for a moment and tell you, when you're constantly getting distracted by the ones going by you, either faster or slower, and you start changing what you're doing, you are not running the race God has designed for you. They, they, they have this thing with horses where they'll put blinders on them so they don't get distracted. And in racing, our, in, 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 in being in our own race, sometimes we need to put the blinders on ourselves so that we stop getting distracted by what others are doing. Just because they can do that very well doesn't mean I have to do that very well to win my race. I need to run my race. Theodore Teddy Roosevelt, our 26th president of the United States, he said it best about comparison when he said this. He said, comparison is the thief of joy. Comparison is the thief of joy. Listen to me today. The surest way to be miserable in your own God-ordained purpose in this life is to compare your purpose with someone else's purpose. Your purpose is unique to you. Remember, he knit you together in your mother's womb. You're special and unique. Your calling is unique. The race you are running is unique to you. I'm reminded of Romans chapter 12, verse 6, when the apostle Paul tells the Roman church this. He said, in his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If, if your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take that responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. What he was trying to tell us is for the church to function right. God has given us all unique gifts. The problem only comes when we start trying to do what our neighbor's gift is. And we leave a hole in what our gift is. God has given each of us different gifts for doing certain things well. But often in the curse of comparison, we just try to mimic what others are doing around us. And we leave holes in the kingdom of God. We leave the gifts God reserved for us behind trying to do something else. And let me tell you how God has to correct that. Because God will never let his church go astray. He will always keep his church going the direction and the plan he has for his church. But your role in what's going on in the church may have to shift. And so you were running this pace... But now you got distracted and you're over here on this pace. And God says, well, I'm going to have to slow Jared down, put him over here. And I'm going to put this person back in their place because my church will not stop. I will still keep moving forward. We will still have this plan go forward. I've said this so many times. The enemy can't stop the, the God from doing something great with his church. The enemy can't stop the plan of God. But he can mess with our role in the plan by distracting us. We have to follow the right pace setter. Listen, when we, I've got a question for you. I want you to consider this. When we follow the wrong pace setter, sooner or later, let me tell you, we will become miserable, tired, and frustrated at our lack of progress. And it's not because we're, 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 doing, we're, we're in the wrong place, the wrong location, the wrong church, the wrong, the wrong thing. What, we're, what happened is we are just running at the wrong pace. At the beginning of this message, I mentioned that there are people who are against pace setters they say that pace setters make for a boring race. A race without pace setters often has these great moments of, of, of drama and energy. If there's no pace setter, then everybody's running around trying to, and there's these great moments of drama and energy, and it's all for the, the audience to enjoy. It's fun for others to watch racers sprinting and pushing for position to lead the race, and sprinting and racing one another for the finish line. It's good for the spectator, because running without a pace setter brings a lot of drama to the race. And this same principle does, in fact, carry over into your life. If you run this race without letting Jesus be your pace setter, rest assured, there will be a lot of drama in your life for others to look at. 
If you ever feel like you're constantly sprinting for some progress and then laying on the side of the road trying to get your breath while others pass you by, you might be running the wrong pace. If you ever feel like you're spending more time fighting for a position in a crowd instead of running a steady pace, you might be running the wrong pace. Your race has a pace setter. His name is Jesus. Ephesians 5 and 1 says, imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. If you will follow his example in this marathon of life, you will find that Jesus will guide you to your personal best finish in this crazy race we call life. And you know what else it is? It's okay if you finish alone. It's okay if you finish that race and there's no drama at all in today's race. You have a new one tomorrow. Don't worry about it. It's okay if there's no excitement at all at the end of it because it's your race, not others' race. You don't need to entertain the ones around you in this life we're, we're, we're trying to live. Don't run your race for the benefit and enjoyment of others. Run the race God has set before you. Growing up, Many of us have heard the, the famous fable of the tortoise and the hare. It's the story of a, this slow-moving creature, the tortoise, and, and a swift and quick creature, the, the hare. And the story goes that the tortoise and the hare decide to run a race. And the hare is very confident in his ability to win the race. So he ends up stopping midway through the race to take a long nap. The tortoise is not very fast at all, but what he lacks in speed, he makes up in consistency. The fable ends with the slow and steady tortoise crossing the finish line before the hare, simply because he never stopped, he never waned, he, he stayed consistent in his race. And the point of the story is that consistency matters. And in like manner, that is the purpose of the pace setter in your life. The winning runner may not lead at the beginning of the race, may not lead in the middle of the race, and may not even lead at the beginning of the end of the race. But by maintaining a consistent pace, by following the pace setter, no matter what others are doing around them, all too often, consistency wins in the end. The race that Jesus sets before you isn't always the flashy pace. It isn't always the, 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 the fastest pace. And very often, unfortunately, it's not even the slowest pace. We have to kind of work to keep up with him. But if you want to win your race at the best time available to you, it will take consistency to run your race and follow his pace. 1 Corinthians 15 and 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Consistency matters. Galatians 6 and 9 says, And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Consistency matters. Run your race. Perhaps in this room you're wondering, Pastor, how, how, how would I do this? You, you're, you're, using, you're giving wise, you're, you're using the, you know, the grand ideas of, of this concept, and, and I'm getting the picture, but how can I be consistent in this race? What does consistency in my walk with God look like? And I'm glad you're, you're wondering that because I need to tell you first, consistency in your walk with God means seeking him daily. We seek him daily by setting aside time every day to pray. For your personal race today, that may mean the first three to five minutes when you get up. You know, often when, when we're talking about and I, and, I, and I encourage you to pray and, and read your Bible every day. But you'll notice that often whenever I'm up here preaching, I don't try to give you something, some, some standard you must meet. I don't tell you you should do this this many hours a day or this many minutes a day and you should do this. The reason I don't do that is because every one of you are in your own personal journey with God. And the moment somebody sets a standard that you can't meet, you either do one or two things. You either rush to catch it and you wear out or you give up because you know it's no way you can do it. Or, there's a third one, I guess, if it's way behind what you're already doing, you just slow down thinking I've already done enough. And you step back from what God has already brought you through. There is, there is something so powerful about, try, about running your personal race. There may be somebody in this room that has never prayed daily in their life, and for you, if you'll put three minutes in the morning you'll just get up and the first thing you do is you say, God, 
I want you to set the pace today. God, you are, you are the one I am trying to imitate. Lord Jesus, you are my king. You are my Lord. Lord, for the next couple minutes, I just want to tell you before the craziness of this life starts, I just want to put you first, and I want to follow after you. That may be the most you've ever done, but just stay consistent doing it. Consistency matters. For someone else's personal race, you may get up in the morning every day and you pray 10, 15 minutes a day. That's okay. Keep doing it. That's consistency. Consistency matters. For somebody else, it may be an hour a day. That's good. Consistency matters. Don't worry about someone else's time. Don't worry about how they're running their race. Run your race and let Jesus set your pace. The second thing you must do if you want Jesus to be the pace setter of your life is you have to learn to look for Jesus in everything. I encourage everyone under the sound of my voice, learn to do as Paul said and pray without ceasing. And praying without ceasing doesn't mean living your whole life with your head bowed and your eyes closed and, and on your knees just praying. You, you die of, 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 of dehydration within a, a couple days if you try to do that. Praying without ceasing doesn't mean you never stop praying. Praying without ceasing means that in everything in life, you're seeking his will. In every decision in life, God, I'm putting you first. Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you to lead and guide me. In every moment, of, in, every, in every step that you take, in everything, in, in every decision you make, you're, you're putting him first. You're seeking his face. You're giving him praise in the good times, and you're giving him praise in the bad times. You're, you're, you're living with a state of gratitude in everything you do, knowing that you're running the race God has set before you. That is what praying without ceasing means. And finally, if you want to be consistent in your walk with God, you have to connect to his word daily. I encourage you, read your Bible daily. All, all too often, we try, to, we try to come up with an arbitrary number. Or we try to match what we heard somebody else say that they, they, they read their Bible. I'm just telling you, don't try to measure your race with somebody else's. Just every day, get in the word of God. And the consistency of reading the word of God means your pace is going to increase every day. And one day you will be at a different pace than you are today. And it's going to be easy. And it's going to be okay because you ran your race. The secret to running your race is letting Jesus set your pace. We could stand today. Today I've come to tell you that we are all called to run our own race. And our Lord and our God Jesus, he is the only one who should set that pace. To follow the pace setter, we have to strive to be consistent. And the only way to achieve consistency, listen to me today, the only way to achieve consistency is first it starts with commitment. Commitment to wake up every morning and say, God, today is your day. Well, I've never done that before in my life, Pastor Jared. I've never woke up in the morning and, and, and made it all about God in my life. Then commit today that tomorrow you're going to wake up and you're going to make it all about him. And that commitment today will continue and turn into consistency every day if you'll follow him. Today, I believe every one of us can take another step in our level of commitment. I really do. Maybe, maybe you're already doing some things that are just amazing and you're walking with God. But I want to tell you, God never just puts us in a place and says, well, he's good right there. I don't have to worry about him anymore. No, God is always drawing us closer. God is always pushing us further down the road. God is always going to push us into a new pace that, that, that we can go further in the kingdom of God. And so, But every new pace in your life starts with a commitment today to go to the next level. So what I want to do today, and we're going to pray for, for things. If you, if you need the Holy Ghost, if you need deliverance, if you need healing in your body, I, I want to pray for all those things. But first, I wonder if we could just gather towards the front because I believe God, during this message, God has placed some things in each of our minds that we need to have a renewed commitment on. So come on, come on towards the front. You just gather towards the front. It's, you, you, you don't, don't, don't feel uncomfortable about it. This is we, something we do every single week as a family. We just come to the front and we worship God for the last few minutes of the service. But before before we jump into worshiping God, before we, we ask him to do different things for us, I want to personally pray for each and every one of you in this room. I want to pray that God will give you an understanding of your next level of commitment and that he will show you that if you will commit in this one thing, it will bring a consistency that changes the pace you're on to bring you to a new level in another anointing. 
So right now, if you'll lift your hands towards heaven, I want to pray for each and every one of you. Father, in the name of Jesus, you see every single person in this room. God, I pray that you will step into their situation, step into their moment, God, and show them what they need to have a renewed commitment in, God. Show them whatever it is that will take them to the next level. And then, God, give them the strength and the fervor and the power to commit to that today so that they could step into a new pace tomorrow and that you could bring them to great things in Jesus name father you see it God and I give you glory right now come on let's give him praise in this place let's give him praise in this house Lord we give you praise in Jesus name just for a moment before we go before they continue worshiping I want to now take a moment and I want to pray in just a few minutes someone's going to be being baptized in Jesus name behind me today maybe there's somebody in this room that wants to say I also want to be baptized in the precious name of Jesus today could be your day maybe there's someone in this room who has never been filled with the precious gift of the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in tongues I want to tell you today can be your day if you will just ask you can receive maybe there's somebody in this room who needs a deliverance from something they need a renewed strength to get them through something Something that's been vexing them and holding them back. Maybe somebody needs a healing in their body. Today, God can do these things for you if you will just ask and believe. So if you'll lift your hands towards heaven, now I want to pray that God is going to do a work in your life like never before. God will give you a confidence to do something new like you've never done. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray let the anointing of the Holy Ghost fall in this place, God. Let deliverance happen to people who are struggling in this room, God. Let there be an anointing that brings people to a new level, Lord God. Lord, I pray for healing healing and let there be people who, who their lives are changed in this moment God I pray in Jesus name I pray for an outpouring of the Holy Ghost God I pray for a new confidence God I pray Lord Jesus for a breakthrough in the name of Jesus God you can provide all that we need and we give you the glory for it we thank you for it in Jesus name in Jesus name
Thanks for joining our online worship experience. We hope it has been a blessing to you and your family. We would love to connect with you. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, or you can go to www.point.church and connect with us there. If you'd like to partner with us in giving, you could download our app, or you could go to point.church and click give. Thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to worshiping with you again soon.